everyone. I wanted to say hello and give a couple of opening remarks for today's Sustainability and Energy Expo. My name is Lily Ambor, and I'm the student lead for the Expo from the Sustainability Education Program. I want to say thank you to all the judges, presenters, and attendees who are here today. Without your continued support during this transition online, this event wouldn't have been possible. Right now, I think it's so important to continue showing up to these kinds of events, not only to connect with one another, but also to continue showing social solidarity. The kind of model that we've been using over the past three to four weeks is that we're making it work. And I know that when you first hear we're making it work, it doesn't sound like anything special, but to me, it sounds like we're being adaptive, we're being resilient during times that are completely unprecedented and sometimes surreal. And right now, I think that's so important. And over the past couple of weeks, the organizing team has put in so much work and effort into making this event happen and making it a fun experience for everyone involved. So today, I want you all to have fun, go learn something, and take away something at the end of the day. So I hope I see you all after awards, and good luck. Hi everyone, um, welcome to room one. Um, I'm Talia, I'm the president of Yeoman Energy Club, one of the co-hosts of this um, Sustainability and Energy Expo. Um, and I will be the moderator for room one today. Um, so just so everyone knows, we are recording um, this presentation. Um, so a, rem a reminder to everyone to mute themselves and turn off your videos when you're not talking, just to ensure that we have uh, good quality video. Um, and I'll just start off by having the judges introduce themselves. Um, if you can, please turn on, turn on your video um, and then unmute yourself um, and just give a brief introduction, um, mostly just your name so that um, all the presenters know who the judges are today. Thank you. Hi. Uh... I'm Nina Panda. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm not able to get my uh, camera to work. Um, I'm one of the judges. Um, brief introduction, so I graduated from the University of Minnesota in 2005. I'm currently living in Amsterdam, working at Nike as a strategic planning director for corporate social responsibility. Um, and in the capacity leading a sustainability working group on how we develop a sustainability strategy for Nike in Europe. Um, pleasure to be here today. I'm looking forward to it. Hi, I'm uh, Krista Massell. I'm also one of the judges and I'm the librarian at the University of Minnesota uh, that liaisons to the Institute on the Environment and sustainability courses. So good luck everyone and I hope you are well and safe. Hi everyone, my name is Jonna Corpy. I am the sustainability coordinator at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, happy to be here and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome. Um, so we're going to get started with the first presentation. Um, uh, just a note to the presenters, um, I will be giving you um, time reminders in the chat window um, during your presentation. So you have three to five minutes to present and then we'll have three to five minutes for judge questions right after. Um, so in this session, we're gonna start with Cyan Luzi, um, then go to Madeline Miller, Anna Healy, um, and then Meredith Song and Clara Holder and finish up with Brennan Roby. Um, so I will share my screen with your presentations um, and you'll be unmuted and then uh, we'll get started. So first up we have Cyan Luzi here. Um, I'll pull up her video real quick. Hello everybody, my name is Siani and today I'll be presenting about the utilization of dairy waste water for sustainable production. So my project was about microalgae and using this microalgae to treat dairy waste water. So 
Microalgae, they are plants ancestors. They are eukaryotic and single cells in this case because I was using chlorella species. They can make photosynthesis and they can also use nutrients from their surroundings to grow. And they have a vast niche, which can be a problem because they can grow anywhere, like this lake here in Minneapolis or Lake Erie between the US and Canada, or in the Gulf of Mexico where we have the discharge from the Mississippi River. So what we have here is this eutrophication process where we have these nutrients from the land that goes to the water and we have natural algae there that use that nutrients and the sunlight to reproduce and to create a layer that will block the sunlight so the plants under there will start to die and the oxygen will deplete. So what we have for, us, for this project is dairy wastewater from um, dairy farm here in Minnesota, in Morris. And we were isolating the microalgae there to treat the wastewater. And so we, we had an objective of produce biomass, microalgae biomass, and return um, this treated wastewater to the environment with less nutrients as possible. And then the biomass would be used for uh, dietary supplement to the calves if they like the taste. So this is the lab scale setup and this is the um, pilot scale setup just outside of the dairy barn. So they were making milking cows here and we were producing in uh, biomass here, microalgae biomass and treating wastewater from these pellets. So each one of the pellets had six of these bags and each one um, was treating 70 liters each time. So study number one was about the ratio of the waste water in water. And we were taking cell counts, biomass production. We were uh, seeing how much nitrate and ammonium and phosphate uh, was obtaining from, from the um, the wastewater and how was the biomass characterization. What I can say here is that we, we are producing a biomass with 49% of protein and iron and magnesium and other micronutrients that were very good for the calves. For the analysis, we were doing randomized complete block in SAS. So here you can see the exponential growth between day two and day three, where as greener as it gets, um, you have more biomass production. So for the first one, we had a very good result. So we have uh, the biomass productivity and nutrients removal rates higher in the treatment where we had one unit of dairy waste water in 10 units of water, which was, which is a, it, it is a very, very good ratio for this kind of study. So study number two was about the taste of the microalgae and see if the calves would like that or not, because then we could close the cycle. So we were using the microalgae biomass that we produced, we sterilized, and we were um, having a lot of different measurements to see if anything harmful was there, but we could not find anything. Uh, so we were using different quantities of the microalgae biomass in their normal grain to see if they would eat it or not and comparing to a control where we didn't add any of the of the microalgae. So the things that we didn't have any difference, uh, so P was was not significant uh, for the dry matter intake, which means that the calves accepted the um, the microalgae so they could eat it with their normal grain. So, and chlorella, if you guys go to the Amazon site, you can, you can buy and have it at our house. So we could close the cycle. We were producing biomass um, that the calves could eat and we also could return good um, with, uh, water to the environment with less 95% nitrates and 50% phosphate, which is very, very good. So for that, thank you. Uh, 
uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll take any questions. Awesome. So we'll go on to judge questions now um, for three to five minutes. Okay, I have a question. Where, what part of the dairy processing is the wastewater coming from and why, um, what's in it that needs to be treated? And yes, you know, so why is that is, why is that important? Can you repeat the, the second question, please? Sure. Um, what's in dairy wastewater that needs to be treated? And oh. What part of the process is it coming from? And what what happens to it right now, I guess, also? It's three questions. Okay. <laughs> not, not a problem. So the first thing is that it was mainly the poop from the calves. So they wash everything after uh, every milking cycle. So and, and then it all goes to this lagoon. So what they do with the things in this wastewater lagoon now is that they will just like spray it in the um, in the crop fields, and that's a problem because it will leach to any water um, stream that is close to that place, or it will percolate inside the soil and it will reach groundwater maybe. And what we have there that is harmful is mainly nitrates and phosphates. And they are just like nutrients that are used so much right now. Um, maybe in fertilizers for agriculture, of course, but we can also find in any um, any waste that we produce in the cities or like anywhere in the world. So it's not like only a fertilizer problem, of course, uh, but we were treating that because of the cropland that we had around the, the milk barn. And thank you for your question. <laughs> we have any other questions from the judges at this time? Hi, I have a question. So based off of um, your study, how scalable is this to um, kind of do this at a wide, at a wide scale production? Okay, um, so thank you for your question. And what we were trying to do, so we had the lab scale first, and then we already were scaling up on pilot scales. So the main uh, ob objective of this study was to produce something that the farmers could do by themselves. So the pilot scale would be something that they, they could already do uh, at their farm, uh, farms, at least to treat uh, some wastewater and to produce some microalgae biomass. Um, so they could already use this scale with the 70 liters bag that we were using. Um, but if we could optimize the system and make it roll um, like without having to to harvest every time, uh, that would make like a big difference because we could treat water con uh, con like every time and produce more microalgae. So that would be something that we could do in the future. But the scale is fine. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cyan and judges. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, we're going to take a minute um, to introduce uh, another judge, Phoebe, who has joined us. Could you just um, give a brief introduction of yourself, please? Um, let's move on to the next presentation. We have Madeline Miller um, talking about line three. I will share her presentation now.
Can I begin? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so hi, my name is Maddie Miller, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the Line 3 tar sands oil pipeline in Minnesota. Um, next slide, please. So first of all, um, what is tar sands oil? Tar sands are a mixture of sand, clay, water, and a thick, sticky black oil called bitumen. The bitumen is what is refined later on in the process to make the oil, but because of its consistency, it doesn't flow easily and cannot be pumped out of the ground in a conventional way. Next slide. The two ways that tar sands oil can be extracted are through either open pit mining or in situ mining. Open pit mining is what is pictured in this slide and is used if the tar sands are located near the surface, to which they can be mined directly using the open pits. In situ mining occurs if the tar sands are too deep to dig up, and so they are extracted by injecting hot steam or solvents to loosen them and then blow them through a well to the surface. These processes require a lot of water, land, and energy. While they're in the process of extraction, um, the transportation needed to move the tar sands to the refinement plants or the refinement process itself to produce a more synthetic crude oil. Next slide. So where is this pipeline that brings these tar sands into Minnesota? The Line 3 pipeline actually already exists, as you can see from the black line marked on the map. The new proposed corridor, as marked in red, shows the proposed expansion of the pipeline, which begins in Alberta, Canada, crosses down through a portion of North Dakota, and then enters Minnesota. In Minnesota, the new Line 3 would cross through a significant amount of treaty territory wild rice lakes and wetlands, and the Mississippi River twice, all of which are marked in this map. The pipeline would also be constructed dangerously close to res reservation lands and reaches its terminal at Lake Superior. Next slide. So why is this important and what are its implications? First, pipelines always leak and Line 3 already has a very harmful past. The existing Line 3 is 56 years old, and in 1991 caused the largest inland oil spill in U.S. history. The pipeline ruptured near Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and spilled over 1.7 million gallons of oil, most of which flowed into the Prairie River, which is a tributary of the Mississippi River. Had it not been for the 18 inches of ice on top of the river, the drinking water for millions of people downstream could have been poisoned. In its lifetime as well, Line 3 has had at least 15 large spills of over 50 barrels of oil, and so the consequences of the, num the number of its smaller spills is unfathomable. Line 3 also has half of a million structural anomalies, which is an issue the new, pipeline, the new pipeline would also no doubtedly face. These environmental disasters are also disproportionately consequential for the indigenous people of Minnesota, for whom an oil spill would wreak havoc on their water sources and wild rice lakes, which are essential to their cultures and livelihoods and sovereignty. On the other hand, the main arguments for this pipeline are that it would create jobs and bring in a lot of money to the state, especially for the counties that the pipeline would run through. It is also argued that replacing old and decrepit pipeline with a new one would be better for the environment. However, next slide. That is actually not the case. Enbridge, the corporation responsible for this pipeline, proposed this new expansion so they could double the capacity of the pipeline to over 760,000 barrels of oil per day. And with all of the energy that goes into its processes would, as you can see, um, add 193 million tons of carbon dioxide as greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, be the equivalent of adding um, 38 million vehicles to our roads, have the equivalent of adding 50 new coal-fired power plants in our state, and um, the amount of energy to sequester the greenhouse gases would require an additional 227 million acres of forest. So, as we know, climate change is a serious issue that needs to be prioritized for the future. And this pipeline will only exacerbate these issues if Minnesota is to reduce its emissions to 35% of what they are now by 2050, as per the policy that was passed in the state legislature. Um, so, this pipeline cannot be reconstructed and the old line needs to be removed. We need to be taking steps 
to move towards renewable energy and a more inclusive, sustainable future, rather than allowing our oil dependency to continue. This pipeline is a giant step backwards. Next slide. This is why I'm asking you to stand with those who want to protect our waters and our futures in the long run and to join the movement to stop line three. Thank you. Thank you, um, Maddie. Let's move on to judge questions for three to five minutes. Thank you, Maddie, so much for that presentation. Um, you did a, a great uh, job kind of giving the, the background and some of the, the risks associated with it. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us maybe some specific action steps that we can take. Um, and I'm curious what also, if you could maybe explain a little bit of what the, on the other side of the perspective, the, the four, um, just to give a little a little bit of balance to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you for your question. There are plenty of ways to take action. There are a lot of um, environmental justice based organizations that exist in Minnesota. And um, I'm currently interning with MN350, which is where I um, fortunately got to receive a lot of this information, became so passionate about this issue. And so, um, Getting more involved and more educated is a really powerful step. It's currently working its way, the proposal for the new corridor is working its way through our state government, which has been um, put on hold a little bit because of um, everything with the pandemic going on. But there's, um, there's lots of organizations to be involved with, lots of ways to donate. There's um, a student group on campus called Students Against Pipelines that is working to educate more students on campus as well on the dangers of pipelines. Um, and really action steps is just educating more people that this pipeline exists um, and that it is a threat to um, our livelihoods, to indigenous livelihoods, to so many different people in our state. Um, and for your second question on the other side of things um, is really a lot of it is predominantly economic where um, it would bring in, it's like a multi-billion dollar project and would bring in a lot of money to our state, especially because um, oil just does have that economic weight to it and it would provide a lot of jobs with the construction of it and um, a lot of people really need those construction jobs. However, um, you know, that's, it's a very short-term solution to a very long-term problem with climate change. We're going to be seeing um, the fossil fuel industry declining and um, the economics behind that causing issues. So it's really only guaranteeing these jobs in the short run. And yeah, some, the Public Utilities Commission who recently approved the um, pipeline certificate of need, um, a lot of their reasoning for this new pipeline proposed corridor is that it's better to have um, a new pipeline that isn't leaking as much as the old one is. Um, and that was a lot of the arguments with that were made um, in regards to environmental issues that were surrounding it. However, a lot of what our argument is, is that it's better to just not burn this pipeline in at all. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, an additional question. So if you're successful or if this is successful in um, diverting or canceling the pipeline of line three, what would be the alternative? So where would, um, where would the uh, tar soil go instead? Um, our main, thank you for a question. Um, the main argument that we, we make in a lot of these cases is that um, we think that the tar sands should really stay in the ground and that we should stop um, extracting them as much as we are, just as um, I mentioned with like the different types of mining and um, the refinement process and stuff like that is it's in incredibly energy intensive and water intensive and land intensive. So we're really um, trying to stop those processes as well and not extract tar sands anymore because it is 
one of the dirtiest forms of oil to be processing. So ideally, um, the state of Minnesota would really um, take more initiative to prioritize alternative forms of energy that are cleaner and reduce our dependency on oil and fossil fuels and things like that. So um, that's really, we're trying to just move away from those processes as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie, and thank you for our judges for your questions. Um, that is our time for questions for Maddie. So let's move on to Anna's presentation um, about anaerobic digestion from food waste. Good to go whenever. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna. Uh, I will be presenting on impact and policies of anaerobic digestion from food waste. Next slide. So, food waste is a major issue in the US and around the world. Next slide. Uh, in 2010 alone, the U.S. produced 133 billion pounds of food waste, and this waste has massive impacts both economically and environmentally. Next slide. Uh, for example, food waste accounts for 21% of landfills in the U.S. Under these landfill conditions, food and organic waste generate greenhouse gases as they decompose, particularly methane. Uh, a viable option for reducing both greenhouse gas emissions and food waste is to use this waste to produce biogas through anaerobic digestion, or AD. Next slide. Uh, AD consists of a series of processes in which microorganisms ferment and degrade organic waste to yield biogas. Next slide. Uh, there are a variety of types of waste that can be used in AD, including wastewater, food scraps, manure, and agricultural waste. Often, different types of waste streams are combined into one digester in a process called co-digestion. Next slide. Uh, during the AD process, two products are formed, biogas and digestate. Biogas can then be used to produce heat and electricity or undergo further processing to produce biomethane, which can either act as fuel or enter the gas grid. Digestate can be used as fertilizer for crops, animal bedding, or in flower pots. Biogas and biomethane are renewable energy sources, and if they are managed properly, can have a net negative carbon footprint. Next slide. Uh, despite these benefits, AD is severely underutilized in the U.S. The technology is sufficiently developed, but the U.S. does not currently have a policy that supports implementation of AD facilities in a profitable manner. Next slide. There are several options for policies to promote implementation of AD facilities. A common option is a flat incentive rate based on how much energy the facility produces, typically in kilowatt hours. Another incentive option offers reimbursement based on the relative decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, called carbon offset markets. Next slide. Other alternatives focus on overcoming barriers to implementation. For example, construction costs are a major deterrent to many farmers, so some governments offer subsidies for material and labor costs. Some areas have also increased the selling price for renewable energy, which makes AD more profitable. Others have Im implemented incentives for consumers who support renewable energy, which increases demand for systems like AD. Next slide. While the effects of e these policies varies by location, Germany has seen great improvements in AD from increasing their incentive rate. This graph shows the number of facilities adopted per year and the corresponding incentive rate. Each time the, number, the incentive rate increased, there was a corresponding increase in AD facilities. This is something the US should keep in mind. The current incentive rate in Germany is $0.24 per kilowatt hour produced, while the rate in Minnesota is 0 0.016 per kilowatt hour produced. While the electricity cost in Germany is significantly higher than the, in the U.S., this difference is not enough to account for the difference seen in the incentive rate. Next slide. 
However, some research has also found that subsidizing construction costs is the most effective and efficient way to promote adoption. This graph shows the corresponding increase in adoption for three policy alternatives, subsidizing construction costs, carbon offset markets, and increasing renewable energy selling price. As you can see, subsidizing construction costs has the steepest curve, which means it is the most profitable and efficient option. Uh, based on this research and the success seen in Germany, these two policies, subsidizing construction costs and increasing energy-based incentives incentives are the most effective way to increase adoption of anaerobic digestion. Next slide. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so we'll do three to five minutes for judge questions. Would this be processing food waste that is on farm or from a local community? Is there like a pipeline of food waste to be processed? Would that be something that also needs to be developed in order to feed the, the AD systems? Yeah, that is a good point. Um, that's not something I focused on as much, but ideally um, it could be food waste from like grocery stores, which is one of the biggest sources of food waste or like local restaurants. Um, I used to work at Panera and uh, we had like all these, um, like all the bread, uh, we ended up with a lot of waste and um, most of it got, just got discarded. So a good option for that would be to send it to an AD facility. But the first op, like the first step in implementing this is implementing more AD facilities because as I said, there are hardly any in the US. Looks like Phoebe's trying to ask a question, but we can't hear her. You said that it's, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have so such bad audio problems over here. Um, so I know you said it's not very well established in the United States yet, but are there any examples in, I don't know, other Midwestern states of early adopters that we could, um, that we could look to as a model? I don't know of many super well established plants here in the US. Um, it's, I don't know why it's been so um, underutilized in the US. Uh, Germany in particular does have a lot of um, success and they're, they're a leader in AD, which is why I use them as an example. Um, and the US really does have the capacity to implement these facilities. I mean, we're a much larger country and uh, I mean, Minnesota and all these Midwestern states are very agricultural, and that's where the most success will be seen in AD. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to move on to Clara and Meredith's presentation. Um, this one is another video, so I'll play that first. Hi, I'm Meredith. I'm a junior studying genetics and gender women's sexuality studies. Um, and I'm Clara, and I am a senior studying nutrition. Brightside at UMN is a self-sustaining social venture that is doing produce distribution better. We focus on improving access to affordable fruits and vegetables and work to connect people through community. Food insecurity is everywhere, including in communities like Cedar Riverside and Southeast Como, where grocery stores don't exist within neighborhood limits. Students at the University of Minnesota and other colleges across the nation also deal with food insecurity, with almost one in five UMN students facing barriers to accessing enough healthy food. We recognize the complexities surrounding access to food, and Brightside acts as a conduit for change in Minneapolis to improve the lives of students and neighbors alike. Brightside at UMN works in two ways, through a Buyers Club subscription service that operates with a weekly charge of three to $20. Students and faculty members can choose a bag price to pay each week and pick up this produce on campus at one of two convenient locations. The revenue from Buyers Club sustains corner store deliveries in Cedar Riverside and Southeast Como, 
which circumvents wholesale minimum orders for the stores and brings the price way down for store owners. It improves the quality and quantity of produce offered as well. We launched Brightside on the UMN campus last year with the support of the ACARA program and the Leadership Minor. We operate with 20 to 30 Buyers Club members each week and deliveries to three corner stores. We partner with Brightside at University of St. Thomas to make wholesale orders, pack Buyers Club bags, and deliver to corner stores across Minneapolis. We foster connection between campuses and communities and are run by student volunteers from across the university. From our personal experiences on corner store deliveries, we have been able to witness how important these corner stores are to sustaining neighborhood communities. We get to interact directly with store owners and community members who show appreciation for our service. We can track how much produce is purchased each week, and we get to see the personalities of store owners and the way that each store location is different. Brightside has been operating in Minneapolis for a number of years, and the growth of the organization continues to be encouraging. From starting out in the neighborhood of North Minneapolis to the size of our reach now, the model of sustainable produce distribution is proven to work. We have branches on three college campuses, have over 100 Buyers Club members, and over 30 corner stores that we make deliveries to every, every single week. Brightside is not only a sustainable business model, but sustainable in practice too. We promote sustainable economic and community development, access to sustainable produce, and reduction of food waste. We're excited to see how our organization grows and look forward to the future of food in Minneapolis. While our operations are partially on pause due to campus closures, we are a student group and offer leadership and volunteer opportunities. Please reach out if you're interested in being involved, and thank you. Awesome, so let's do another three to five minutes for judge questions. I might have missed it, but where is the produce coming from? I can answer that one. Um, so we actually buy wholesale produce from the wholesale produce distributor in um, Como. And then some of the summer um, corner store deliveries are supplemented with produce from the um, St. Thomas Garden site. Thanks all for that um, nice overview. I'm, I'm curious if you saw how this could be expanded. Um, I know you were looking mostly at North Minneapolis, but there's also um, issues out in like rural uh, Minnesota and things. So I was wondering if maybe you could expand, uh, if you could talk about how this, this idea could be expanded possibly. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. That's definitely something we've thought about, um, especially considering that we ourselves are an expansion of the nonprofit to um, the University of Minnesota and the surrounding communities. Um, our model right now relies a lot on university partnerships, um, and so that would definitely be something to consider if we were going to expand to places like rural Minnesota. Um, yeah, that would definitely be something to consider, especially with um, the University of Minnesota Extension Program or working with smaller um, colleges, maybe in Duluth or something like that. Um, yeah, but we currently are just based in Minneapolis. So yeah, that's a great idea. And we'd love to consider something like that for the future. Thanks. This is very similar to a farm box through a CSA type subscription service. Um, is there a possibility that you could work directly with farmers I feel like it would maybe increase costs, which is maybe what you guys are trying to avoid is to keep the cost down so that people can have access. But um, if there's a way to subsidize and be able to work with local farmers to produce or to provide that produce, if that's been explored at all. Yeah, that's another good question. Um, we've thought a lot about this and because our chapter is a little bit new, we have been doing a lot of things the same way that um, Brightside at St. Thomas has been doing it with wholesale produce, but we have been in conversation with Courtney and Cheetah from the Cornucopia Student Organic Farm, who actually approached us asking if we were interested in buying wholesale from the farm. And that would work especially well in um, the, the summer and early fall when they're um, producing and they 
can sell to us at wholesale rates. And so I think that would be a great option. Um, the other part of it is just since we do the buyer's club and corner store deliveries year round, it's sometimes not always feasible to have local food in the winter and um, early spring. But yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so real quick, before we move on to our last presentation of session one, um, at the end of this session, we are going to ask all presenters and judges to show their videos if they have that capability, um, because we weren't able to take a group picture at this um, event, um, we're going to do a group screenshot instead for this session. So um, after this last presentation, we'll do that just so you know. Um, so up next we have Brennan um, and I will share his presentation. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm Brennan, um, and uh, I uh, just this will be my last class as an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota studying supply chain and operations management. Um, I was on the Germany trip with the delegation. Um, I will be talking about nuclear fusion. Just uh, before I get into it, nuclear fusion is just one of two ways to create nuclear energy. Uh, the other is nuclear fission, which is the splitting of two atoms, uh, where nuclear fusion is the combination of two lighter atoms, uh, and then that creates one neutron. Um, it's basically excess mass uh, to create energy. Next slide, please. So like I said before, it's the, it's the exact opposite. Uh, nuclear fusion is what the sun does to pre produce energy. Um, basically, you usually have two hydrogen uh, to form helium in most cases. Um, it, you, it creates energy just by uh, using heat engines. Uh, in the heat engine, the kinetic energy of fusion products is converted into heat when inside the reactor. The heat is then converted to mechanical en energy. Um, after that, the mechanical energy is converted to electricity through various generators. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the reason it isn't here yet um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of nuclear fusion, but it takes more energy to stabilize than what it is producing. Uh, but there are companies, private companies, such as ITER um, in Germany that are producing uh, models, uh, but they are hesitant to releasing it to the market. Uh, and that's specifically just because of that stabilizing issue. There's a ton of heat that goes into it, so it's hard to uh, contain. Um, and then expensive research, if we wanted to consider uh, in the US continuing to study it, uh, we would probably need government funding. Um, and although high capital is raised, or is, is needed to be raised for the initial buildings and generators uh, and power plants, uh, the sus sustaining it after that is actually pretty low cost. Uh, next slide, please. So my proposal now, as we wait for the research and the technology to um, be more viable in the future, uh, we just educate the students of or educate students and general public of the stigma of around, nu around nuclear um, being bad because nuclear fission has had a history of uh, a pretty negative stigma. Uh, so if we could implement it in school, school districts along with curriculums of renewable energies, although nuclear fusion isn't technically renewable energy, um, it is sustainable uh, and teach the infrastructure that needs to be built for when it does come up, come and it will be easily incorporated into society in the future. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, any questions? I'm curious if um, the biggest issue with nuclear fission is the waste products that come with it. Would fusion have similar waste products or would that be something that would be not an issue with fusion? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the waste products and fission are much more, there we go, I think the video is working. Hi. Um, so waste products in fission are, they're a lot more uh, in comparison with fusion. And, and it is still, uh, there are still byproducts and waste that is coming from fusion, but it's dramatically less and less toxic, supposedly. 
Thanks for your question. Are any other countries exploring fusion? Yes. Um, so Germany is one in that. I can't remember the other one. Um, it's uh, just another organization, but yeah, I know they are exploring it. Uh, I think the main thing is, I think there are a lot of countries exploring it and researching it, but uh, companies are just like, uh, just hesitant on releasing even models to market. Um, and there's a lot of uh, regulation that goes into it, obviously. So uh, I think it's more of not, um, not like countries researching it, but more of uh, companies, privatized companies trying to release it to, to the market. So. <clears throat> Hi, you mentioned um, just that the model, there was the hesitance in the releasing the models to market. Um, why do you think that is? Is that because of the lack of education and stigma? I think partially stigma. Uh, government regulation is definitely one. But uh, the, I think the big issue is, is that with uh, like um, stabilizing the heat, they want to make sure that the safety precautions are in place and they are, um, you know, viable to the point where they can, you know, safely say that nothing that has happened with the nuclear fission reactors, uh, because some most nuclear fission, fission uh, power plants are pretty antiquated and old. Um, I know Bill Gates uh, made one that was, you know, like <laughs> pretty, pretty impressive um, and uh, a lot less dangerous than the ones that we've seen in the past. So I think that's kind of the main reason why they, uh, they're not coming out right now. Thank you. Thanks for the question. What, what, what specific fear with um, fusion technology? Like, I mean, what's, what's their worst case scenario? Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a similar process as fission, except that there's a lot more heat. So the main like issue is um, obviously if it destabilizes, there could be with any nuclear power plant, there could be um, uh, dramatic uh, um, <clears throat> repercussions such as um, we've seen in the past where they, you know, they, they aren't stabilized and um, uh, explosions are I'm trying to think of like just they kind of collapse and those they can be really dangerous for the public um, but if the technology is in place then we should be okay newer technologies awesome um so we're gonna do just a quick break um our next round of presentations will start at 1 p.m um so until then i'll just present our break presentation um but feel free to come back at one and see the next round of presentations thank you <laughs> <laughs>